Hi, fifth graders. The second nonfiction article we're going to read before Watson's go to Birmingham is this um, primary sources article. Primary sources are something written from the person involved or that experienced it. Um, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, you see this image right here. Ralph Abernathy left and Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. right are taken by a policeman after they led a de line of demonstrate demonstrators into the business section of Birmingham, Alabama on April 12th, 1963. Um, many students don't know that Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. didn't just lead the I Have a Dream speech and the March on Washington. He led many protests around the country during the 1960s. Um, the background of this story, there's an editor's note, and I think it gives you some more context as to why this story is important. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was put in jail in 1963. He was arrested because he spoke out against unfair laws. In that time, many places in the Southern US had segregation. White people and black people were separated. They used different bathrooms. They went to different schools. The system of segregation was very unfair. It was also cruel. King wanted to end segregation. In this letter, King writes to some white religious leaders in the South. They were worried about King's protests. And just a side note, this idea that these religious leaders were worried, it was they felt that they were disruptive. I am here in the Birmingham City Jail. You called our protest unwise and untimely. I feel that you are good men. So I would like to explain our protest to you. I will be patient and honest. You feel like we are outsiders coming in. I am the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We have groups in every Southern state. We work with 85 other groups in the South. We are not outsiders. A group of, in Birmingham invited us. They wanted help with a peaceful nonviolent protest. That is why we are here. I came to help. Segregation is here. I cannot just sit in Atlanta watching what is happening in Birmingham. I came to help. You say you hate the protests. Why do you not hate the reasons for the protests? The white people in control of the city ignore the rights of black Americans. This is what brought us here. Birmingham is one of the most segregated cities in the United States. The police are very cruel. Black Americans cannot get fair trials in court. Black homes are destroyed. Churches are bombed. Black leaders tried to talk about pro the problems with city leaders. It did not go well. But last September, some black and white leaders began to talk. Certain promises were made. They promised to remove signs that bully black people. Weeks and months passed, nothing changed. The signs stayed where they were. We got ready to protest. We had workshops. We taught ways to peacefully control our anger. We taught the protesters they cannot hit back. Even if someone hits them, they cannot hit back. We taught the protesters how to act inside a jail. The protest was ready. We stopped spending money in stores owned by whites. This hurt businesses. They needed our money. Still, it was peaceful. We felt it would help, it would make people think about changing. Both sides need to talk. Peaceful protests make people nervous and tense. We hoped it would make people talk about changing. Both sides need to talk. You say our protest should wait. My friends, people not, do not change all by themselves. For years now, I've heard the word wait. This word wait always means never. We have waited more than 340 years for our rights. We cannot wait. You do not see that we cannot get a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. You do not see that your poor black brothers surrounded by rich white people. You do not have to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the, amuse to the amusement park. There are commercials for it on television, still she cannot go there. Only white kids can, can go. You have not seen the tears in her little eyes knowing that she cannot go. You do not hear her ask, Daddy, why do white people treat black people so mean? 
You do not have to sleep in your cars because motels will not let you in. You do not see those awful white and colored signs. When people treat you as badly as they treat us, you will understand. You are upset because we break laws. You do the same thing, though. It is 1963. You still have separate, segregated schools. You do not obey the law. The law came from the Supreme Court in 1954. The Supreme Court said that schools could not stay segregated. They said separate could never be equal. I do want people to obey fair laws. There are fair laws. There are unfair laws. Any law that lifts a person up is fair. Any law that puts people down is unfair. All segregation laws are unfair. They separate and put people down. I want people to not follow segregation laws. They are unfair and wrong. I do want people to obey fair laws. The 1954 law from the Supreme Court is fair. Here is another way to say it. Alabama voted for unfair segregation laws. In the state of Alabama, there are unfair laws. They keep black Americans from voting. In some places, not one black person can vote. That is unfair. Sometimes a law is fair, but it is used in an unfair way. For example, there is a law that says you must get permission to have a parade. In some cases, a parade is a meeting of people to celebrate. It can also be a meeting of people to protest. There is nothing wrong with this law. I asked for permission to have a protest parade. The city would not give me permission. I disobeyed and marched in our parade. Because of this, I was arrested. The law is fair. Still, it was used in an unfair way. Some laws are evil. In Hitler's Germany, there were evil laws. One law made it a crime to help Jews. At the time, Jews were being hurt and killed. It was terrible and wrong. Still, because of Hitler's law, many Germans did not help. I know I would have helped my Jewish brothers. You say our peaceful actions are wrong because they cause violence. Think about it this way. A man with money is robbed. Did having money cause the robbery? No, this is not so. We do not cause the violence. We must protect the man who was robbed. We must punish the robber. We must build. It is strange to me that people think time will solve the problems. Time does not care. It can be used to destroy or build. We must build. I now stand in the middle of two very different groups of Black Americans. One group of Black Americans have been victim of years of cruelty. Segregation has beaten down this group. The other people in this group have gone to school. They are educated. They have business skills. They make money from whites and blacks being kept separate. They forget about the problems of most other black people. The other group of black Americans are angry. Many are full of hate. This group is calling for violence. They want their own black nation. This group has lost faith in America. It has lost faith in the Christian church. I have tried to stand between these two groups. I stand between them with love and nonviolent protest. Black Americans have many pent-up feelings and frustrations. They have to get them out. So let them march. Let them pray on the steps of City Hall. Let them have sit-ins at lunch counters. Let them get a cup of coffee. Understand why they must have freedom rides on buses that can enter any city. If these feelings do not come out in these nonviolent ways, they will come out in awful violence. This is not a threat. This is a fact of history. Am I protesting too much? Was Jesus protesting too much when he said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them? Was Abraham Lincoln protesting too much when he said, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free? I had hoped that the average white person would join our protest. Maybe I expected too much. I am thankful, though, that some of our white brothers have joined us. They've written about our struggle. Others have marched with us. They have sat in with us at lunch counters. They have rode with us on the Freedom Rise. Rides, they have slept in dirty jails. I began leading the bus protest in Montgomery in 1955. In this protest, we stopped riding the buses. 
I thought the white churches would help us. So many stayed silent. Religious leaders of the South tell their people to go along with the law. I have really wanted to hear white ministers say that segregation is wrong. I want to hear them say that blacks are our brothers. Instead, white churches stand on the sidelines. There was a time when the church was very powerful. Today, the church, today's church is weak. Its voice changes nothing. The church lets things stay where they are. It will lose millions of members if it does not change. It will become an unimportant social club. It will have no meaning today. Nothing will stop us. If the church does not help us, we will still reach our goal in Birmingham. We know this because the goal of America is freedom. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, we were here. For more than 200 years, slaves worked here. They made America rich by picking cotton. They built the grand homes of their masters. The cruelties of slavery could not stop us. Nothing will stop us. We will win our freedom. I must talk about one more thing you have said. You warmly praised the Birmingham police force. You said they kept order. They stopped the violence. Have you seen their angry and violent dogs? They bite peaceful black protesters. Have you seen how they treat black people here in the city jail? Have you seen them push and curse old black women and young black girls? Have you seen them slap and kick old black men and young boys? Have you seen them refuse to give us food in jail? Should you praise the police department? I wish you had praised the black protesters for their perfect courage. I wish you praised their amazing control. One day, the South will know and remember its real heroes. One will be James Meredith. He faced angry and violent white people and painful loneliness. He just wanted to go to college. One will be 72-year-old mother Pollard. She just kept walking. She refused to ride to work. She refused to ride in the back of the bus. She said that her feet hurt, but her soul felt rested. Others will be young high school and college students. They sat peacefully at lunch counters. They were beaten. They, were t they went to jail. They sat down at lunch counters. They stood up for the best part of the American dream. Never before have I written a letter this long. It would have been much shorter if I had been writing from a comfortable desk. What else is there to do when you are alone for days in a tiny jail cell? You write long letters. You think strange thoughts. You pray long prayers. If I have said anything in this letter, that it is not in praise of brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King Jr. We will do some close reading um, about his letter from the Birmingham jail and why he was there and how he felt. Um, but it's a really great piece to understand um, some of the less brighter moments of the civil rights movement.